Hello. We're back for another evening of Ursula K. Le Guin. Today we will be reading Chapter 6 of A Wizard of Earthsea entitled Haunted. But in the meantime, it's going to take a minute and get cozy. And uh, then we'll get started in earnest. So hang tight and bear with me. And uh, give me a minute or two. All right. So last time, Ged decided he needed to go out and deal with the dragon of Pendor in order to allow him to sort of deal with his shadow problem without leaving the islanders in the lurch. And he succeeded. <laughs> and that's where we left off. Oh, hang on. My cat's asking for some attention. All right, buddy. Hang on. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 6 Haunted As soon as Pandor had sunk under the sea rim behind him, Ged, looking eastward, felt the fear of the shadow come into his heart again. And it was hard to turn from the bright danger of the dragons to that formless, hopeless horror. He let the mage wind drop and sailed on with the world's wind, for there was no desire for speed in him now. He had no clear plan even of what he should do. He must run, as the dragon had said, but where? Tarok, he thought, since there at least he was protected, and might find counsel among the wise. First, however, he must come to Low Torning once more, and tell his tale to the Islemen. When word went out that he had returned, five days from his setting forth, they and half the people of the township came rowing and running to gather round him and stare at him and listen. He told his tale, and one man said, But who saw this wonder of dragons slain and dragons baffled? What if he... Be still, the head isle man said roughly, for he knew, as did most of them, that a wizard may have subtle ways of telling the truth, and may keep the truth to himself, but that if he says a thing, the thing is as he says. For that is his mastery. So they wondered, and began to feel that their fear was lifted from them, and then they began to rejoice. They pressed around their young wizard, and asked for the tale again. More islanders came, and asked for it again. By nightfall, he no longer had to tell it, they could do it for him, better. Already the village chanters had fitted it to an old tune and were singing the Song of the Sparrowhawk. Bonfires were burning not only on the Isles of Low Torning, but in townships to the south and east. Fishermen shouted the news from boat to boat, from isle to isle it went, Evil is averted, the dragons will never come from Pendor. That night, that one night, was joyous for Ged. No shadow could come near him through the brightness of those fires of thanksgiving that burned on every hill and beach, through the circles of laughing dancers that ringed him about, singing his praise, swinging their torches in the gusty autumn night, so that sparks rose thick and bright and brief upon the wind. The next day, 
he met with Petveri, who said, I did not know you were so mighty, my lord. There was fear in that, because he had dared make Ged his friend, but there was reproach in it also. Ged had not saved a little child, though he had slain dragons. After that, Ged felt afresh the unease and impatience that had driven him to Pandor and drove him now from low torning. The next day, though they would have kept him gladly the rest of his life to praise and boast of, he left the house on the hill with no baggage but his books, his staff, and the otak riding on his shoulder. He went in a rowboat with a couple of young fishermen of low torning who wanted the honor of being his boatman. Always, as they rode on among the craft that crowd, I'm sorry, <laughs> always, as they rode on among the craft that crowd the eastern channels of the Ninety Isles, under the windows and balconies of houses that lean out over the water, past the wharves of Nesh, the rainy pastures of Dromgen, the malodorous soil sheds of Geeth, word of his deed had gone ahead of him. They whistled the song of the Sparrowhawk as he went by. They vied to have him spend the night and tell his dragon tale. When at last he came to Surd, the ship's master, of whom he asked passage out to Roke, bowed as he answered, A privilege to me, Lord Wizard, and an honor to my ship. So Ged turned his back on the Ninety Isles, but even as the ship turned from Surd inner port and raised sail, a wind came up hard from the east against her. It was strange, for the wintry sky was clear, and the, weathered heads, and the weather had seemed settled mild that morning. It was only thirty miles from Surd to Roke, and they sailed on, and when the wind still rose, they sailed on. The little ship, like most traders of the inmost sea, bore the high fore and aft sail that can be turned to catch a headwind, and her master was a handy seaman, proud of his skill. So, tacking now north, now south, they worked eastward, Clouds and rain came up on the wind, which veered and gusted so wildly that there was considerable danger of the ship jibing. "'Lord Sparrowhawk,' said the ship's master to the young man, whom he had beside him in the place of honor in the stern, though small dignity could be kept up under that wind and rain that wet them all to a miserable sleekness in their sodden cloaks. "'Lord Sparrowhawk, might you say a word to this wind, maybe?' How near are we to Roke? Better than halfway, but we've made no headway at all this past hour, sir. Ged spoke to the wind. It blew less hard, and for a while they went on fairly enough. Then sudden great gusts came whistling out of the south, and meeting these they were driven back westward again. The clouds broke and boiled in the sky, and the ship's master roared out ragefully, This fool's gale blows always at once! Only a mage wind will get us through this weather, lord! Ged looked glum at that, but the ship and her men were in danger for him, so he raised up the mage wind into her sail. At once the ship began to cleave straight out to the east, and the ship's master began to look cheerful again. But, little by little... Though Ged kept up the spell, the mage wind slackened, growing feebler, until the ship seemed to hang still on the waves for a minute, her sail drooping amid all the tumult of the rain and gale. <laughs> Pardon me for a moment, I gotta open the door for my cat. I'll be right back. Go ahead, buddy. I'm sure he'll be back, like, in a minute. <laughs> Okay, where were we? That's right, the wind slackened. <clears throat> oh no, the wind is <laughs> roaring, but they remain becalmed. Then, with a thunder crack, the boom came swinging round and she jibed and jumped northward like a scared cat. Ged grabbed hold of a stanchion, for she lay almost over on her side, and shouted out, Turn back to Surd, master! The master cursed and shouted that he would not. A wizard aboard, and I the best seaman of the trade, and this the handiest ship I ever sailed. Turn back? Then, 
The ship, turning again, almost as if a whirlpool had caught her keel, he too grabbed hold of the stern post to keep aboard, and Ged said to him, Leave me at Surd and sail where you like. It's not against your ship this wind blows, but against me. Against you? A wizard of Roke? Have you never heard of the Roke wind, master? Aye, that keeps evil powers from the Isle of the Wise, but what has that to do with you, a dragon tamer? That is between me and my shadow, Ged answered shortly, as a wizard will, and he said no more as they went swiftly with a steady wind and under clearing skies back over the sea to Surd. There was a heaviness and a dread in his heart as he went up from the wharves of Surd. The days were shortening into winter, and dusk came soon. With dusk, Ged's uneasiness always grew, and now the turning of each street seemed a threat to him, and he had to steel himself not to keep looking back over his shoulder at what might be coming behind him. He went to the Sea House of Surd, where travelers and merchants ate together of good fare provided by the township, and might sleep in the long raftered hall. Such is the hospitality of the thriving islands of the inmost sea. He saved a bit of meat from his dinner, and by the fire pit afterward he coaxed the otak out of the fold of his hood where it had cowered all that day, and tried to get it to eat, petting it and whispering to it, Hog, hog, little one, silent one. But it would not eat, and crept into his pocket to hide. By that, by his own dull uncertainty, by the very look of the darkness in the corners of the great room, he knew that the shadow was not far from him. No one in this place knew him. They were travelers from other isles who had not heard the song of the Sparrowhawk. None spoke to him. He chose a pallet at last and lay down, but all night long he lay with open eyes there in the raftered hall among the sleep of strangers. All night he tried to choose his way, to plan where he should go, what he should do, but each choice, each plan was blocked by a foreboding of doom. Across each way he might go lay the shadow. Only Roke was clear of it, and to Roke he could not go, forbidden by the high, inwoven, ancient spells that kept the perilous island safe. That the Roke wind had risen against him was proof that the thing that hunted him must be very close upon him now. That thing was bodiless, blind to sunlight, a creature of a lightless, placeless, timeless realm. It must grope after him through the days and across the seas of the sunlit world, and could take visible shape only in dream and darkness. It had as yet no substance or being that the light of the sun would shine on, and so it is sung in the deed of Hode. Daybreak makes all earth and sea, from shadow brings forth form, driving dream to the Dark Kingdom. But if once the shadow caught up with Ged, it could draw his power out of him and take from him the very weight and warmth and life of his body and the will that moved him. This was the doom he saw lying ahead on every road, and he knew that he might be tricked toward that doom, for the shadow, growing stronger always as it was nearer him, might even now have strength enough to put evil powers or evil men to its own use, showing him false portents or speaking with a stranger's voice. For all he knew, in one of these men who slept in this corner, or that of the raftered hall of the sea house tonight, the dark thing lurked, finding a foothold in a dark soul, and there, waiting, and watching Ged, and feeding, even now, on his weakness, on his uncertainty, on his fear. It was past bearing. He must trust to chance, and run wherever chance took him. At the first cold hint of dawn, he got up and went in haste under the dimming stars down to the wharves of Surd, resolved only to take the first ship outward bound that would have him. A galley was loading turby oil, she was to sail at sunrise, bound for Havanor, a great port. Ged asked for passage of her master. A wizard staff is passport and payment on most ships. They took him aboard willingly, and within that hour the ship set forth. 
Ged's spirits lifted with the first lifting of the forty long oars, and the drumbeat that kept the stroke made a brave music to him. I'm going to take a brief moment to drink some water. <clears throat> and yet, he did not know what he would do in Havnor, or where he would run from there. Northward was as good as any direction. He was a northerner himself. Maybe he would find some ship to take him on to Gaunt from Havanor, and he might see Ogion again. Or he might find some ship going far out into the reaches. So far, the shadow would lose him and give up the hunt. Beyond such vague ideas as these, there was no plan in his head, and he saw no one course that he must follow. Only he must run. Those forty oars carried the ship over a hundred and fifty miles of wintry sea before the sunset of the second day out from Surd. They came into port at Oremi, on the east shore of the great land Hosk, for these trade galleys of the inmost sea keep to the coasts and lie overnight in harbor whenever they can. Ged went ashore, for it was still daylight, and he roamed the steep streets of the port town, aimless and brooding. Oromi is an old town, built heavily of stone and brick, walled against the lawless lords of the interior of Hosk Island. The warehouses on the docks are like forts, and the merchants' houses are towered and fortified. Yet to Ged, wandering through the streets, those ponderous mansions seemed like veils, behind which lay an empty dark, and people who passed him, intent on their business, seemed not real men, but voiceless shadows of men. As the sun set, he came down to the wharves again, and even there, in the broad, red light and wind of the day's end, sea and land alike to him seemed dim and silent. "'Where are you bound, Lord Wizard?' So one hailed him suddenly from behind. Turning, he saw a man dressed in grey, who carried a staff of heavy wood that was not a wizard's staff. The stranger's face was hidden by his hood from the red light, but Ged felt the unseen eyes meet his. Starting back, he raised his own yew staff between him and the stranger. Mildly, the man asked, What do you fear? What follows behind me? So, but I'm not your shadow. Ged stood silent. He knew that indeed this man, whatever he was, was not what he feared. He was no shadow, or ghost, or gebeth creature. Amidst the dry silence and shadowiness that had come over the world, he even kept a voice and some solidity. He put back his hood now. He had a strange, seamed, bald head, a lined face. Though age had not sounded in his voice, he looked to be an old man. I do not know you, said the man in grey, yet I think, perhaps, we do not meet by chance. I heard a tale once of a young man, a scarred man, who won through darkness to great dominion, even to kingship. I do not know if this is your tale, but I will tell you this. Go to the court of the Terranon if you need a sword to fight shadows with, a staff of you would will not serve your need. Hope and mistrust struggled in Ged's mind as he listened. A wizardly man soon learns that few indeed of his meetings are chance ones, be they for good or for ill. In what land is the court of the Terranon? In Oskil. At the sound of that name, Ged saw for a moment, by a trick of memory, a black raven on green grass who looked up at him sidelong with an eye like polished stone and spoke, but the words were forgotten. That land has something of a dark name, Ged said, looking over at the man in grey, trying to judge what kind of man he was. There was a manner about him that hinted of the sorcerer, 
even of the wizard. And yet, boldly as he spoke to Ged, there was a queer, beaten look about him, the look almost of a sick man, or a prisoner, or a slave. You are from Roke, he answered. The wizards of Roke give a dark name to wizardries other than their own. What man are you? A traveler, a trader's agent from Oskill. I am here on business, said the man in grey. When Ged asked him no more, he quietly bade the young man good night, and went off up the narrow step street above the quays. Ged turned, irresolute whether to heed this sign or not, and looked to the north. The red light was dying out fast from the hills and from the windy sea. Grey dusk came, and on its heels, the night. Ged went in sudden decision and haste along the quays to a fisherman who was holding his nets down in his dory, and hailed him. Do you know any ship in this port bound north, to Semel, or the Enladus? The long ship yonders from Oskil, she might be stopping at the Enladus. In the same haste, Ged went on to the great ship the fisherman had pointed to, a long ship of sixty oars, gaunt as a snake, her high bent prow carven and inlaid with disks of lodo shell, her oar port covers painted red, with the rune Siffle sketched on each in black. A grim, swift ship she looked, and all in sea trim, with all her crew aboard. Ged sought out the ship's master, and asked passage to Oskil of him. Can you pay? I have some skill with winds. I am a weather worker myself. You have nothing to give. No money. In low Torning, the Islemen had paid Ged as best they could with ivory pieces used by traders in the archipelago. He would, <clears throat> he would take only ten pieces, though they wanted to give him more. He offered these now to the Oskillian, but he shook his head. We do not use these counters. If you have nothing to pay, I have no place aboard for you. Do you need arms? I have rowed in a galley. Aye, we're short two men. Find your bench, then, said the ship's master, and paid him no more heed. So, laying his staff and his bag of books under the rower's bench, Ged became, for ten bitter days of winter, an oarsman of that northern ship. They left Oromi at daybreak, and that day Ged thought he could never keep up his work. His left arm was somewhat lamed by the old wounds in his shoulder, and all his rowing in the channels about Low Torning had not trained him for the relentless pull and pull and pull at the long galley oar to the beat of the drum. Each stint at the oars was of two or three hours, and then a second shift of oarsmen took the benches but the time of rest seemed only long enough for all Ged's muscles to stiffen, and then it was back to the oars. And the second day of it was worse, but after that he hardened to the labor and got on well enough. There was no such comradeship among this crew as he had found aboard Shadow when he first went to Roke. The crewmen of Andradian and Gauntish ships are partners in the trade, working together for a common profit, whereas traders of Oskil use slaves and bondsmen, or hire men to row, paying them with small coins of gold. Gold is a great thing in Oskil, but it is not a source of good fellowship there, or amongst the dragons, who also prize it highly. Since half this crew were bondsmen, forced to work, the ship's officers were slave masters, and harsh ones. They never laid their whips on the back of an oarsman who worked for pay or passage, but there will not be much friendliness in a crew of whom some are whipped and others are not. Ged's fellows said little to one another, and less to him. They were mostly men from Oskil, speaking not the hardic tongue of the archipelago, <laughs> wow, of the archipelago, but a dialect of their own, and they were dour men, pale-skinned with black, drooping mustaches and lank hair. Kellub, the Red One, was Ged's name among them. Though they knew he was a wizard, they showed him no regard, but rather a kind of cautious spitefulness, and he himself was in no mood for making friends. 
Even on his bench, caught up in the mighty rhythm of the rowing, one oarsman among sixty in a ship racing over void gray seas, he felt himself exposed, defenseless. When they came into strange ports at nightfall, and he rolled himself in his cloak to sleep, weary as he was, he would dream, wake, dream again, evil dreams that he could not recall waking, though they seemed to hang about the ship and the men of the ship, so that he mistrusted each one of them. All the Oskillian freemen wore a long knife at the hip, and one day, as his oar shift shared their noon meal, one of these men asked Ged, Are you slave or oath-breaker, Caleb? Neither. Why no knife, then? Afraid to fight? said the man, Skior, jeering. No. Your little dog fight for you. Otak, said another who listened. No dog, that is Otak. And he said something in Oskillian that made Skior scowl and turn away. Just as he turned, Ged saw a change in his face, a slurring and shifting of the features, as if for a moment something had changed him, used him, looking out through his eyes sidelong at Ged. Yet the next minute, Ged saw him full face, and he looked as usual, so that Ged told himself that what he had seen was his own fear, his own dread reflected in the other's eyes. But that night, as they lay in port in Essen, he dreamed, and Skior walked in his dream. Afterwards, he avoided the man as best he could, and it seemed also that Skior kept away from him, and no more words passed between them. The snow-crowned mountains of Havanor sank away behind them southward, blurred by the mists of early winter. They rode on, past the mouth of the Sea of Ea, where long ago Elfarin was drowned, and past the Enladus. They lay two days in port at Berilla, the city of ivory, white above its bay in the west of myth-haunted Enlad. At all ports they came to, the crewmen were kept aboard the ship, and set no foot on land. Then, as a red sun rose, they rode out on the Oskill Sea, into the northeast winds that blow unhindered from the islandless vastness of the North Reach. Through that bitter sea, they brought their cargo safe, coming the second day out of Berilla into port at Neshum, the trade city of eastern Oskil. Ged saw a low coast lashed by rainy wind, a gray town crouching behind the long stone breakwaters that made its harbor, and behind the town, treeless hills under a snow-darkened sky. They had come far from the sunlight of the inmost sea. Longshoremen of the sea, gold, of the sea Guild of Neshum came aboard to unload the cargo. Gold, silver, jewelry, fine silks and southern tapestries, such precious stuff as the lords of Oskill hoard, and the freemen of the crew were dismissed. Ged stopped one of them to ask his way. Up until now, the distrust he felt of all of them had kept him from saying where he was bound, but now, afoot and alone in a strange land, he must ask for guidance. The man went on impatiently, saying he did not know, but Skior, overhearing, said, The court of Terranon? On the Kexempt Moors. I go that road. Skior was no company Ged would have chosen, but knowing neither the language nor the way, he had small choice. Nor did it much matter, he thought. He had not chosen to come here. He had been driven, and now was driven on. He pulled his hood up over his head, took up his staff and bag, and followed the Oskillian through the streets of the town and upward into the snowy hills. The little Otak would not ride on his shoulder, but hid in the pocket of his sheepskin tunic under his cloak, as was its wont in cold weather. The hills stretched out into bleak, rolling moorlands as far as the eye could see. They walked in silence, and the silence of winter lay on all the land. How far? Ged asked, after they, had gone, <clears throat> after they had gone some miles, seeing no sight of village or farm in any direction, and thinking that they had no food with them. 
Obscure turned his head a moment, pulled up his own hood, and said, Not far. It was an ugly face, pale, coarse, and cruel, but Ged feared no man, though he might fear where such a man would guide him. He nodded, and they went on. Their road was only a scar through the waste of thin snow and leafless bushes. From time to time, other tracks crossed it or branched from it. Now that the chimney smoke of Nishum was hidden behind the hills in the darkening afternoon, there was no sign at all of what way they should go or had gone. Only the wind blew always from the east, and when they had walked for several hours, Ged thought he saw, away off on the hills in the northwest where their way tended, a tiny scratch against the sky, like a tooth, white. But the light of the short day was fading, and on the next rise of the road he could make out the thing, tower or tree or whatever, no more clearly than before. "'Do we go there?' he asked, pointing. Skior made no answer, but plodded on, muffled in his coarse cloak with its peaked, furred, Oskillian hood. Ged strode on beside him. They had come far, and he was drowsy with the steady pace of their walking, and with the long weariness of hard days and nights in the ship. It began to seem to him that he had walked forever, and would walk forever, beside this silent being through a silent, darkening land. Caution and intention were dulled in him. He walked as in a long, long dream, going no place. The otak stirred in his pocket, and a little vague fear also woke and stirred in his mind. He forced himself to speak. Darkness comes now, and snow. How far, Skior? After a pause, the other answered, without turning, Not far. But his voice sounded not like a man's voice, but like a beast, hoarse and lipless, that tries to speak. Ged stopped. All around stretched empty hills in the late dusk light, sparse snow whirled, a little falling. Skior, he said, and the other halted and turned. There was no face under the peaked hood. Before Ged could speak spell or summon power, the Gebeth spoke, saying in its hoarse voice, Ged! Then the young man could work no transformation, but was locked in his true being, and must face the Gebeth thus defenseless. Nor could he summon any help in this alien land, where nothing and no one was known to him, and would come at his call. He stood alone, with nothing between him and his enemy but the staff of yew wood in his right hand. The thing that had devoured Skior's mind and possessed his flesh made the body take a step towards Ged, and the arms came groping out towards him. A rage of horror filled Ged, and he swung up and brought down his staff, whistling on the hood that hid the shadow face. Hood and cloak collapsed down, nearly to the ground under that fierce blow, as if there was nothing in them but wind, and then, writhing and flapping, stood up again. The body of a Gebeth has been drained of true substance, and is something like a shell or a vapor in the form of a man, an unreal flesh clothing the shadow which is real. So, jerking and billowing as if blown on the wind, the shadow spread its arms and came at Ged, trying to get hold of him as it had held him on Roke Knoll. And if it did, it would cast aside the husk of Skior and enter into Ged, devouring him out from within, owning him, which was its whole desire. Ged struck at it again with his heavy, smoking staff, beating it off, but it came again, and he struck again, and then dropped the staff that blazed and smoldered, burning his hand. He backed away, then all at once turned and ran. He ran, and the Gebeth followed a pace behind him, unable to outrun him, yet never dropping behind. Ged never looked back. He ran. He ran through that vast, that vast dusk land where there is no hiding place. Once, the Gebeth in its hoarse, whistling voice called him again by name, but though it had taken his wizard's power thus, it had no power over his body's strength and could not make him stop. He ran. Night thickened about the hunter and the hunted, 
and snow blew fine across the path that Ged could no longer see. The pulse hammered in his eyes, the breath burned in his throat. He was no longer really running, but stumbling and staggering ahead. And yet the tireless pursuer seemed unable to catch up, coming always just behind him. It had begun to whisper and mumble at him, calling to him, and he knew that all his life that whispering had been in his ears, just under the threshold of hearing. But now he could hear it, and he must yield, he must give in, he must stop. Yet he labored on, struggling up a long, dim slope. He thought there was a light somewhere before him, and thought he heard a voice in front of him, above him somewhere, calling, Come! Come! He tried to answer, but he had no voice. The pale light grew certain, shining through a gateway straight before him. He could not see the walls, but he saw the gate. At the sight of it, he halted, and the Geveth snatched at his cloak, fumbled at his sides, trying to catch hold of him from behind. With the last strength in him, Ged plunged through that faint, shining door. He tried to turn to shut it behind him against the Geveth, but his legs would not hold him up. He staggered, reaching for support. Light swam and flashed in his eyes. He felt himself falling, and he felt himself caught, even as he fell. But his mind, utterly spent, slid away into the dark. That's the end of chapter six. Thanks for listening in if you did today. Uh, today we listened to Takashi Kokobo has 2001 album Wins. It's on Spotify and on Bandcamp. You can find more info about his music uh, and where it's located, uh, both on YouTube and in my Twitch About section. Um, feel free to take a look at my YouTube channel. It's got a bunch of videos that don't exist on Twitch anymore. And um, I had a great time reading today, and I hope you all had fun listening in. Next week, I'll probably return to Guile of Sphere. Don't want to keep the Vance fans in the dark for too long, else they might start throwing really weird words at me. Um, but yeah, if you hung out today, thanks. I appreciate it, and I uh, hope you keep listening, and I hope you had a good time. And uh, have a great week. <laughs>